Hello and welcome everybody. Today we have a real life story of, of entrepreneurship and some of the challenges modern day startups can face with new geopolitical and global market dynamics. So coming from Wargaming, Anton Kolkowski founded Bullberry Studio, Studio um, a few years ago to build mid-core free-to-play mobile games. And last year, in a very difficult geopolitical environment, Bullberry was unable to raise a follow-on round of funding. And also joining us today is Felicia Co, Vice President from Play Ventures, one of the premier early-stage venture capital firms with a focus on gaming. So the objective of our discussion today is to walk through Anton's journey with his startup to hear about the lessons he learned and things he would do differently. But we also want to get Felicia's advice on how she would have advised Anton. And finally, to talk about where are we today and moving forward in the current dynamic and changing geopolitical environment. What should Anton do today to begin the journey of starting another game studio, if, if that's what you want to do, Anton? And what is the market like? And what would it take for someone like Felicia to fund a new game studio, given all the changes and things happening in today's environment? Welcome, Anton and Felicia. So, you know, Thank I, you, uh, Thank you. <laughs> I'm really excited to have this conversation today. A huge fan of learning and retrospectives. And so for the first part of the discussion, I thought, Anton, we could start with you talking just about your story. Felicia, feel free to give feedback, jump in and provide a little bit of additional color where you can. But before we kind of dive into this stuff, I was wondering, uh, Anton and Felicia, do you want to talk briefly about your backgrounds and what, what are you guys currently doing before we, we kind of head into the main part of the conversation? Today's episode is sponsored by Data.ai to access estimates for rankings, downloads, revenue, usage, or engagement for millions of apps on the App Store and Google Play. Sign up for Data.ai. Uh, so, hi, everybody. Uh, you know, I joined the gaming industry uh, more than 10 years ago. I uh, uh, joined Wargaming. Before that, I was doing a little bit of you know, investment banking and uh, uh, analytics research. So at Wargaming, I was responsible for corporate development, strategy, investments uh, for a good number of years. And then uh, I moved on to manage a, a, like a large investment we made into VR. It was a uh, location-based VR, big, big project. And I oversaw uh, building World of Tanks VR within that uh, in the product uh, and direction. And a couple of years later, I moved back to kind of motherland for gaming doing uh, mobile games. So as a producer of internal ideas with external teams. So I basically effectively kind of moved myself from a little bit of business background to more kind of product background. And uh, like close to three years ago, I left Wargaming and started my own studio, uh, Wolverine Studio, and had to close it down in December. And now a couple of weeks ago, I, I joined a new, a new venture that I will tell you a little bit about later. So I'm, I'm Felicia. I'm actually just been promoted to partner at Play Ventures. Oh. Uh, I was... I'm, yeah, I was employee Congrats. number one. Congrats. Thank you very much. I was employee number one. Actually, I joined Hari and Henrik uh, back in 2018 when they first started the fund, which was a $40 million fund, uh, doing, doing early stage uh, gaming investments. Um, since then, the funds we have had grown. Um, we now have about 320 mil um, in terms of assets under management, but we still very much focus on the early stage of gaming. So pre-seed seed is our usual sweet spot. We can go up to Series A investments. Still investing into free-to-play. Uh, we've also obviously invested into Web3 companies as well and, and, and what we call gaming services, which is really kind of like a catch-all, a very badly named catch-all but for anything that's in and around gaming. So that could be at tech. That could be things like Mod.io, which does UGC uh, for games. Um, so a bunch of things. I also led an investment into an avatar tech company a few years ago, which has been acquired. So um, it's a very, very diverse group. Um, but yeah, we're, I'm based in Singapore. We invest globally from India to Indiana. The only territory we don't invest in is China. Um, and yeah, really, really excited to be here and chatting with Anton. I think it's a great story. and We need to you know, talk more about uh, these kind of retrospectives as well. All right, Anton, so it'd be great to hear your story. Maybe you could start by talking about Bullberry. How did it start? What was sort of the strategy or intention behind the studio? Right, so uh, it started when I was back at Wargaming, producing like an internal ideas with external team. So one of the team happened to be led by uh, my ex-colleague from Wargaming, ex-Unity, 
you know, each other for many years, uh, had like a development team uh, on outsource basically, right? So we were doing a lot of research, but then COVID happened uh, to all of us uh, in early 2020 and Wargaming decided to simultaneously with COVID decided to shut down a lot of initiatives uh, internally just to, you know, uh, become kind of leaner, let's say. And uh, so a lot of my projects were shut down too. And I decided it's a good and a perfect storm opportunity to try something new. So I, I joined that team that we were working in externally. I joined them uh, full time. We, we formed a new venture, Bulber, which became Bulber Studio. It was around like May 2020. And uh, we had some kind of pro raw prototypes. And one of that, we developed a little bit further. Uh, it was around the idea, no, most of the concepts were around the ideas of skill based games. Uh, when I say skill, it means like uh, games like Clash Royale or like uh, shooter games where, you know, gamer skill uh, means something versus, you know, meta games where it's it's more around kind of progression through, you know, construction or something like that, right? Or or pay, let's say. And so we were keen on, on skill-based games and uh, in the people in the team who were like many, many years players of StarCraft and League of Legends, right? And, and so... One of the ideas that we saw was very perspective was kind of RTS style game, right? So we took that game, we polished it a little bit as a prototype, and we we went fundraising. We actually talked to Playwatch's team. I knew Harry from his times when he uh, was running his own startup, and I was at Wargaming corporate, you know, developing team, investing in. It was, so very tight relations. Um, Harry gave a lot of good feedback. Uh, but it was too early for uh, for playing at the time. Anyway, we uh, we were like six people at the time. We you know talked to many many funds, but eventually uh, what clicked was my games venture capital. Uh, I think uh, for uh, for the reasons of you know we talk the same language, you know they understand the culture. They were more I think kind of favorable to to our circumstances and gave a little bit more, more belief into us, let's say, right? Um, so the idea of the game was this, the, the vision was, hey, we reinvent uh, uh, real-time strategy games for mobile. And, you know, the usual, uh, the usual let's say, uh, explanation of what the game is, is like Clash Royale makes Total War Arena or Total War series, which I, which I hate to kind of do those mixings of, you know, games and genres, to explain what I do, because I think uh, when you do the game, it's the game in itself. But anyways, it was Clash Royale mixed Total War Arena in the sense that you have, you know, card-based kind of meta, mm -hmm. but then on the core gameplay, uh, you have those uh, kind of a little bit larger uh, uh, squads of, of troops, and you, you fight in a PvP skill-based online uh, synchronous battle, with direct control over your, over those troops, and so there is that RTS element where you you tell them, "Hey, go there, fight this, you know, make it your flank maneuver." Uh, and so there's a lot of kind of second to second tactics, uh, which piles into like a you know three minute strategy kind of match. Right. right, and Anton, maybe I could just stop you there for a second, and and maybe kind of shifting back to you, Felicia. So. There's a studio here. They've worked together before, worked for a larger organization, Wargaming, that has had success. Um, but there's six guys, and looks like the approach they took was working on a bunch of prototypes until they found one that they had a sort of belief in. And Felicia, when you look at a team, whether it's back then, and may maybe you were aware of uh, Anton's presentation at the time, and, and for this kind of a team, kind of starting off, getting started, uh, six people with a prototype, how would you evaluate um, this kind of a team or what would you be looking for um, if, if Anton were to approach you today, six people with a prototype and this kind of like idea for, for the kind of kind of game that, that Anton just described? I mean, I think the the way we look at things now versus how we would have looked at it then is a little, little bit different. Okay. I think there's the, there's there's still things that we we would like, right? So the stuff that you said, you know, you guys have worked together. That's always a plus point. That's de-risking. Yeah. I think from a VC point of view, it's always like thinking, okay, what are all the risks here, and which parts are de-risked? And the more de-risked it is, the better it is, right? So. Yeah. 
is better for the company as well because you can you can also command a higher valuation. So great, the the, the team has worked together. I mean, it sounds like pretty uh, intriguing, interesting uh, concept where you have that RTS element, the core to it, uh, with the, the 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 card hero meta. Um, so that sounds interesting. Could be an interesting opportunity. I think how we differ and how we look at opportunities now um, in this climate is is a few things. Um, you know, after IDFA and everything for mobile free to play, we just see a lot of teams, even with great games, even with like objectively, you know, if you talk about 2020, 2021, like objectively really good metrics, mm -hmm. still struggle to scale. Um, and, you know, you could still say like, yeah, you can probably find a way to do performance marketing at scale. And that's true, but it's less straightforward. Mm -hmm. I think in the past, there was this sentiment of, and, and I think we shared that sentiment. If you created a great game, there was a known playbook of things with great certainty that you could execute. And, you know, it's a matter of spending, optimizing, and you could probably scale your performance marketing to get the user base. That's less certain now. So whereas now we, in the past, we would say, hey, you know, you don't have a marketer on a team. You don't have somebody who knows that. That's OK. You could probably hire for that. Right. Let's figure out the game first. Let's make sure it's fun. Now, you know, the way we would think it as well. OK, this team knows product. Does this team also have that Swiss Army knife, somebody who mm. also understands performance marketing or, you know, or ideally and or <laughs> a, a very kind of go to market driven founder who really understands that and is really hyper focused on that? Because um, there are things that you can do on the pay UA front, but there are also probably now a bunch of levers that you have to pull in mm. order in order to scale a game. Um, and nobody has well very few teams right now have the good news is very few teams seem to have the answer to it <laughs> so i can't tell you how many times we went to gdc this year and everybody's like we're going to use influencers um and you're like great like the other 50 companies i talked to and like maybe out of all of them only one team has like or two teams have actually done even small experiments at small scale right. that like are actually like okay that sounds like something that you could use repeat scale but like it also shows me that you're thinking out of the box you're like a modern day growth hacker if you will i hate that title but right. <laughs> if you will um somebody like that so i think we look for that composition as well of somebody who's thought about the go-to-market rather than okay let's just only focus on the game and then you know repeatable playbook playbook that we can execute when time right. comes. Not just product expertise, but you're looking for growth expertise or performance marketing based expertise in today's yeah. world. Yeah. Yeah. And I think so, some teams have a, you know, have different approaches to it. We've seen teams where they they literally have their own in-house influencer mm -hmm. as a as a founder and they pair that with a really strong dev team, right? Remains to be seen whether that creates super scalable impact. I think obviously it gives them a leg up at the start. Um, some people hire for what we call community growth leads. Um, and these are kind of people who focus on growing community in whatever ways and different tactics, not just kind of being a community manager. That's not what this role is about. So different ways of approaching it. Um, okay. I wouldn't say there's like a hundred percent known playbook for success, even in team composition. All right, back to our story, Anton. So you talked to to, uh, yeah, totally. to my games. You you got an initial round of funding. Was it like a just just for the audience to understand? Was it a typical right. sort of venture investment type of relationship, or was it a investment plus publishing relationship? Or could you um, go into a little bit more detail in terms of like the structure? Yeah, yeah, sure. I think it's not it's not a secret. Um, mm -hmm. So my, my game venture capital uh, at least used to work. Uh, I know they changed the approach a little bit, but they used to work in a way that they provide the, the venture funding at the initial kind of seed round uh, uh, of a decent size, let's say, um, and also uh, uh, strike an option call agreement with you. Basically, uh, they have the right to buy out in up to fifty one percent, right? Mm. Uh, and they control kind of the board in a way to kind of, uh, you know, to maintain diligence, etc. Uh, so it's like a typical deal, uh, which involved a lot of, uh, a lot of also incentives for the founders uh, to grow the company uh, to basically when they buy out uh, this, you know, uh, up to 51%, everybody's, everybody's incentivized and happy. Um, yeah. And, and the, the thesis they invested under was that uh, kind of let's, 
um, investigate whether uh, RTS games on mobile is, is a viable option because like at the time, you know, strategy segment was stagnant. And that was also part of our kind of finding uh, when we are like market, when we are, we are doing market research and trying to kind of form our thesis, hey, there are a lot of kind of great games. They, yes, they, they dominate the market like Clash Royale, Clash of Clans. And then there are a lot of kind of Forex games with, with heavy construction loops and heavy monetization kind of mm -hmm. elements. But there is nothing new, right? There is nothing new that sticks. So wh why so, right? Like when we saw certain hints that there are games like uh, Dawn of Titans, which kind of shut down around that time, but had a very strong uh, user base and, and, and relatively well kind of monetized. Uh, and, and other games were trying to do more, you know, RTS kind of mechanics in the core gameplay. And so we thought, hey, why, why don't we do this? Like, we, um, uh, we love Total War in the series. I, you know, we love Clash Royale kind of and Supercell games. We know a lot about kind of skill-based gaming and PvP. Uh, why don't we try to do this? Uh, and so we pitched to my games and, and they, you know, there was alignment in, in interest. And I think this is the most important thing when you try to fundraise uh, or when you're successful at fundraising. It's, it's when you click with, you know, your thesis or your, your vision clicks with the thesis of, of the investor. Mm -hmm. And then there are a lot of kind of red flags or yellow flags are really kind of could be mitigated in, in a way. Um, and so basically, again, uh, to keep on telling the story, the, the timeline uh, we raised, it was like the fall of the fall and winter of 2020. We, when we signed and got the money, uh, we threw away the prototype, which was like Unity, scrappy kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we, threw a lot, we threw away a lot of content because it was, you know, low quality. Um, and, you know, we, we threw away the technology in, because... We, we had to decide what technology do we use. And so we decided we're going to use Photon Quantum, which is a cool cool engine for, you know, PvP games. Mm -hmm. Recommend, highly recommend. And um, and I, our team in three months basically rewrote everything, mo most everything from scratch. Um, and and that, that we did done a, a new content, we've done new, new, you know, UX UI, we've done, you know, this PvP technology, and we had the kind of the core of the game. We tested it on the market right now, like in, in spring 2021. And we had like good retention metrics to, to like to the quality of the product. It was, you know, uh, well above 20%, like close to 25, I think. Oh, D, and, D1? Uh, Sorry, Anton. Yeah, D1. D1, okay. D1, yeah. D1 retention. It was like, you know, very quick like vertical slice on a good technology, let's say on a good technology basis, okay. like versus a prototype. And so we started kind of building upon that. Uh, and 2021, we spent building, you know, those core building blocks of, you know, core gameplay, you know, meta systems, like, uh, and also the, you know, the building blocks of the team, you know, hiring people for, for doing this, you know, gradually, gradually. I won't, you know, delve into the details, but, up like close to the end of 2021, we were like 15 people. Uh, we had, you know, content up to, you know, day 30 for sure. Uh, and we had like mon basic monetization. We had, you know, battle pass, you know, quests, uh, basic leaderboard. Uh, we, we didn't have anything for you know, day, 30, day 30 plus, like clans and, you know, com com complex tournaments, uh, chat. All those kind of things, so complex monetization in, in in a way like offers work right these days, like based on user behavior and cohorts, etc. But we had like the basic game, right? And it was you know pretty polished, and we got positive re reviews from from users. We tested on, on uh, you know monetization campaigns. We had like relatively good retention, more on a kind of low side of what we wanted to do, and so we were like we were focusing a lot on. Hey, what shall we do now to uh, to to basically level up the game? You know, five five to ten percent more uh, to squeeze everything we can out of you know uh, out of the audience in in, in the retention in the retention uh, uh, context. Okay, and and, and maybe I could uh, sorry sorry just to, to just to uh, stop you a bit there. So when so you went from six to fifteen, you're working on the game launching. You, you, you it sounds like you launched fairly quickly just to get initial metrics, 
uh, 30 days yeah. of content, and then you were primarily at that time focusing then on retention. And were you focusing on D1 or a specific, were you focused on a specific like DX retention or was it mainly D1 or just overall? Uh, and how, how did well, you like, go, well, go ahead. We were looking on, uh, we were looking on day one, day seven and day 14, you know, progressively, like uh, in March, it was only day one. Then next time we tested in September, it was day seven. And then October, we, it was day 14. And uh, November, we launched monetization tests. Uh, and uh, it was already day 30. So it was close to, to autumn and winter. Things started to develop really quickly. Um, because we, we built a lot of foundations for, for, you know, for technologies. And then you know, all the things started to kind of come together. But... Okay we still had the problem with the day one retention and um, the conversion from basically install to, you know, tutorial complete, let's say, right? Mm, okay. So, uh, so you were looking at, sorry, sorry to keep interrupting you, yeah, yeah, just sure. for the audience, just because there's a lot of people who, who, who are kind of going through this issue now. And um, also w would be great if we could get you to jump in Felicia real quick. But so when you, so when you were, soft launched and you were focusing on D1 retention. And then from there, your focus was how do we get D1 retention from say, like you initially started with uh, say 20, 25%, you were trying to add an additional 5% to that. And then you were also trying to figure out how to optimize your, your Fatui, your tutorial to just get that Fatui completion percentage to as high as possible. And maybe yeah. going over to you, Felicia, for the typical startup, gaming startup that you work with, is this a typical approach or are there other things that you would recommend to founding teams in terms of in soft launch, like a focus or things that they should be talking about? But, you know, oftentimes, you, you know, a lot of teams do focus on retention first. Uh, what, what are your current thoughts? I mean, I, I would agree that we still, we still, you know, look at teams that focus on that day one, day three retention. Um, you know, if you can have a more built out curve day seven and things like that, that's great. But I mean, at the very least that day one needs to be kind of fixed um, mm -hmm. because everything else after that is kind of like <laughs> a little bit more challenging if you don't get that right. Um, I think there's, there's, so there's the business of the making games itself and then the business of building a business, which is where I want to kind of ask Anton a question. So if, if I, if I understood sure. correctly, mm -hmm. um, so, so they had the your investors basically had an option to buy fifty one percent of the company to get as as part of their seed funding deal. Yeah, was that the terms that was right? Okay, so so yeah, I, I guess that was how they probably used to operate. I don't know if that's how they currently operate, but like from a VC perspective, at least for most, I think VCs in a, in a, in in the Western world, or or yeah, it, it's quite difficult to look at such a deal because you essentially have somebody on the table, um, on the cap table with the option to buy a majority equity stake. Um, and, and it, it probably has terms that option to buy at a certain multiple on um, maybe revenue or something like that. I, I don't remember, I don't know what the details are, but that, that kind of essentially is something for us, which is a bit of a concern where it's, it's kind of a flag because you're kind of kept on the upside of, where the company could go. Well, so if the company does really well, I guess they want to buy you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I understand and I, I agree. But at the time, um, you know, things were going kind of as planned, let's say. So like we were not right. raising really. Uh, yeah. We had a good partner and, and my games, uh, uh, Venture Capital was really helpful. So they had the team of the producer, game designer. So there was mm -hmm. a lot of synergies and, and close work like week to week in in trying to kind of help us and, and we, you yeah. know, provide value back, value back to them and our, our feedback on other projects. So it's, it's a community uh, in a way. Okay. So everything was going kind of according to the plan. There were like, you know, first signals of, you know, certain difficulties in a sense that we were uh, not getting the certain metrics that we expected in terms of retention. Sure. Um, sure. And, and like, there was a lot of, you know, discussion and huddling and, and trying to understand what like why and what shall we do and you know a b testing but again if you're a startup and you own a deadlines you know certain milestones and plans that your investor expects from you from you and you kind of you know uh, kind of enforce yourself to 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 kind of keep right 
it's 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 so hard to do those a b tests and make quick decisions because it it sure. everything takes time and if you're making a pvp game an online pvp pvp game where there are so many uh so many uh hypotheses why why things don't work well maybe sure. it's because exactly. we have like a weak ai and bots are boring or it's because you know pvp is not working or it's because you know, and and we need a lot of you know online concurrency or it's because you know, we're just missing, you know, we, had, we were testing in, in Russia initially, then UK, and then Brazil. Maybe we're just missing our you know audience. Or maybe like our creatives, you know, are not right, you know, and right. and, and we are not maybe we were using Facebook, maybe we should test on Google because everything matters. Like Google gives you different audience than Facebook. Right? Right. And so in every, every kind of question and answer to those questions, um uh, they take time. And when you're a startup, it's so important that you have somebody, you know, by your side. And this is where, you know, certain high skilled VCs are important and they bring value. Sure. They kind of help you navigate. Hey guys, you know, just focus on this. You know, this is the, the root cause that we saw like hundred out of the studios and kind of solved yeah. or, you know, talk about. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and Anton, maybe I, I, have, I have a I have a question for oh, just for ahead. Anton. Like, yeah. like while you were while you were working on you know bringing up day one, it sounds like you guys knew that one of the areas was that install to FTU in completion, um, and and obviously you you know you're probably in discussions about your roadmap and the milestones. Was there ever a discussion about like, hey, what is the how do we know if like we are succeeding in bringing up? The retention like is there a benchmark that we're trying to meet is there a deadline by which time we say like okay look from a runway perspective we had so many much funds right and and like like you said game making is hard right so it's, unfortunately in the first game sometimes is not not the one that works out so ha- were there conversations around you know internally with just the founders and the team and as well as with uh, with my games about okay this is when we're going to call it a day because we've sunk a lot of time into this and maybe we need to go back to draw important and maybe start something new? That's a, it's a really good question. And I think you are, you know, jumping a little bit into kind of conclusions and the lessons I learned. <laughs> um, but, but, but it's okay. I think, I think this, is, this was a really important lesson to me that um, I was well, like well, we as a team and me specifically, I was uh, really over-optimistic in a way and overconfident that, you know, this is the thing we should do it, you know, we'll, we're going to be successful. And so, you know, my, my advice or my, my, uh, my finding is that you have to find that fine line between being confident and, and being just wrong, you know, uh, and not seeing and not understanding and not hearing other people saying you, hey, or metrics telling you that, hey, you know, you know, go back, you know, you go to this drawing board, right? And so I, I think there were kind of there was time that we could have done that and we didn't, right? Uh, yeah, and maybe I can just kind of jump in here just to follow follow up on a few 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 threads uh, that that we had already discussed. But going back to your point, Felicia, um, I do think when it comes to like the corporate investment, and I, I know this was kind of this approach was popularized uh, here in Silicon Valley, you know, back back even the days of like Cisco in the nineteen nineties, right, where uh, you know, like these companies, basically, the, the perspective is we can't do internal R&D very well. So we're going to try to create programs to fund outside studios, but then have a, a, you know, kind of like a path to acquisition. But then I think uh, to your point, Felicia, I think the one thing that teams like yours, Anton, maybe just as, as a retrospective should, should then understand is to the point of, OK, well, if you do that kind of deal, then the danger is that other VCs would view that as having potentially limited upside. But at the same time, in that scenario, I, I do think, to your point, Anton, you know, my games may bring a wealth of experience, other games, network, uh, expertise, but then you'd also want to make sure that they would then be like, how much commitment do they have if things if, if trouble hits to continue to invest and, 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 you know, invest in kind of bet on the company longer term. Um, so, so I thought that was a good point that you brought up Felicia, but then now going back to this question of, of where you, you know, how you kind of started in soft launch and maybe just like, if, if I could actually get you to go into a little bit more of the specific 
thinking process behind, okay, you know, D1 retention and um, Fatui completion. Anton, you had mentioned you had a number of hypotheses on, on how you can get raise that, but could you actually walk us through? So then you're sitting here with maybe, you know, call it 25% D1 retention. And then what specific process or what what was the approach you took to to try to figure out, okay, we, we're trying to raise D1 in retention. We're trying to increase, you know, tutorial completion from say, you know, whatever it is, 55% to 65%. How did you guys come up with the different initiatives or things to try? Or what was that approach? If you can go into a little bit more detail, Anton. Sure. It's a good question. Uh, but, but just to just to mention, mm -hmm. we actually internally never called what we've done a, a soft launch. We called that oh, okay. a series of, of tests. Okay. And because there is like a, a more more or less clear notion of what is a soft launch in the industry. It's, it's basically where you try to get your monetization done, and and when you kind of launch in a little bit of uh, in a number of markets, let's say, right? So and we launched on. Only on you know, two countries, basically, initially, uh, in a very limited scope of Google Play Open Beta, um, and, and so there was no organics really, just very, very, very tiny. And and we just pushed like a you know a thousand people, thousand installs, you know, this month, and then you know two thousand installs next month. So like a, it's limited tests. And actually, I think I'm 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 yet not sure whether that was a, the right approach in the, in the sense that when I came back when I came to investors like you know, six months later, still not in the soft lunch, really saying, mm -hmm. Hey, I need you know money to run the soft lunch now. And, you know, we are about to go there. And, you know, the investors are asking and partners are asking, like, do you have any metrics uh, from any tests? I'm, I'm saying, yeah, I have, I do. And I'm showing them. And this is like a zoo of metrics from different periods, from different mm -hmm. cohorts, from different countries, from different product scopes. And it's they're not beautiful, you know. They're not good, uh, and, and, but the game looks like it's a done game. It's like a complete game, and so the the impression that um, that's that's the investor has is like, well, those guys tried everything and they you know they failed already. Why why do they need a soft land? Mm. So it's a little bit of a trap of kind of yeah a trap, I think. But uh, but anyway. Going back to your question, which is a good question, like how do you how do you understand and, and work with the hypothesis? You know, uh, we had two approaches. Our initial approach for a very long time was a continuous improvement of small stuff. Hey guys, you know we have a, a lot of um, uh, crushes, for example, right? We had, at, at certain point in time, we had four percent crushes uh, of Unity. And, and hypothesis was, hey, you know, this kind of drops retention a lot. At a certain point in time, we had just problems with the performance because uh, FPS was, you know, you know, falling down up to like 15 FPS, you know, 20 FPS from, from 30. So a lot of kind of spikes back and forth. And so the, the hypothesis was, hey, you know, people are, are not kind of tolerating this kind of you know, bad performance. And so we were solving that problem, that problem, that problem, right? Or like improving just the, the overall kind of flow and quality of the tutorial, uh, you know, adding certain windows, you know, polishing. <laughs> Eventually what we, what we found out and what we saw was it doesn't, it doesn't change. It, it is not changing anything. Mm -hmm. Nothing was changing. Like uh, we were changing also, we were playing a lot with the length of the tutorial and the complexity of the tutorial because there's a lot of debate in the, in the industry and in the studios. You know, one side is is telling you, hey, you know, make the tutorial skippable, you know, and, and don't over explain to people, you know, everybody knows how to play. They are just, you know, irritated by this because it's a, a skill-based game. It's a mid-core gaming, right? But the other side tells, and, and the numbers actually tell that, no, you should explain. You should go step by step gradually and, you know, tailor to everybody. Uh, and this approach actually works better. But what I found kind of as a general trend is that the conversion to uh, to basically the, like the first battle or something, right, is directly tied to the, to the time. And so if you have like a one-minute tutorial then versus three-minute tutorial, so the one-minute tutorial will, will perform much better just because it's only one minute. And people still have attention span. This is that simple. 
Um, and so for us, basically, nothing, nothing worked really to improve the conversion. What we found out eventually, and we, what we didn't really do, uh, like we never asked ourselves really deeply whether our metrics are good or bad. So we were focusing on just improving what we got. So and we had like around 70, 75 conversion to first battle. And we thought, well, why don't we do it like 80 to 85? Can we do it? Let's do it. Versus it actually like doesn't matter. It's maybe it's a good metric for the, for the, for the, for the genre or for the subgenre mm -hmm. or just for your game. Right. I think this is very important to understand because you can have really, really, you know, low day one retention and, you know, conversion to first battle, but then everybody who converted stays forever. Right. It, and then you have your unique, unique economics, etc. So you, you don't have to be super focused on improving unless you're 100% sure that you need improvement. I think this is also yeah. a lesson for us. Yeah, Anton, I, I think to your point, there, there have been a couple of games that I've worked on before where the D1 retention was relatively like 25% and people are wringing their hands. But the, the, the tricky part is some of these games actually may have lower D1 but because they have such strong D365, you know, you have long-term revenue stacking over time and then those games become profitable. But who can wait that long? <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? To, to wait for it. So, so like you really got to, the other thing I would have recommended is just watching your ARPU curve and not just, you know, because it's, it's that balance between retention and monetization. And so, so if you continue to see ARPU increasing, that that could be an argument, whether it's to your investors or you know your corporate sponsors. That hey, you know we are seeing improvement. So um, I, I totally understand the, the the initial focus on retention. I agree that that should be initial focus. But I, I do recommend other teams who might be watching just also keep a track on where your ARPU curve is is going and watch that very closely because you never know. Like some of these games just have different dynamics relative to you know what what people would typically expect how a game to perform. Yeah, I, I think you brought up something as well um, in the earlier part of your story where you were talking about how you went to investors and, you know, you had metrics, but from very, very small cohorts, right? Um, and, and like very, like all over the place in terms of timing. And I think that's something that we often see with teams as well, um, especially when they come. And I think the challenge is if like you come and we, we ask you about, so how big is this cohort? Because obviously... It's great if you're a day one retention, just like 60%, but not really great if your daily cohort's like 100 installs. It's not very meaningful. And I think that's the problem. Like, you you know, if 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 there are people out there listening and thinking about like, I'm going to do my tests, like really you need a meaningful size of cohorts, like, you know, 500 installs a day. Um, if right. those metrics are really going to move the needle with any conversation, right? Um, if you yeah. have like a hundred installs a day in a daily cohort, that's just, it's nice, but it's, it's like, I, I can't really extrapolate anything from this. So right. and, it, and it doesn't Felicia, really help. Felicia, maybe to, to add on to your point, cause I totally agree with you that the one other thing that I, I would recommend to like game teams is not to try to fool themselves. Right. And so sometimes you'll run a bunch of tests and it's like, oh yeah, this specific cohort on iOS in the U S yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can like try to like um, selectively pick certain cohorts, certain tests to try and make it seem like you're doing better than, than, than you are. So I, I think there's like this balance between not to be overly negative where it's just like, ah, you know, uh, we can't be successful just because this, just because other games have better metrics, but also on the other side. And I think this is especially um, a problem with bigger companies where they try to like, oh, you know, what is, uh, what is some higher up going to say? So let's, let's just kind of like fool ourselves and fool them or just present it, create a narrative. And then that's also equally destructive. So yeah, I, this is this is definitely a tricky part. I, I think Anton, the the experience that you're relating, this is one of the the, the most difficult parts of getting game <laughs> games to be successful, right? Is like navigating this first part, coming up with the specific hypotheses, and and I do think that's an area where I I would hope more game teams like reach out to other people to get advice, but also to have strong conviction internally, like 
you know, and not to take too many small swings, because it, it sounds like some of the things that you were, you guys were trying a lot of things, whether it's uh, tutorial completion and other things, it wasn't quite moving the needle. And then in that case, yeah. you know, I, I think one of the things that some, especially like, you know, I, and I don't want to call out specific companies, but there are certain companies that come from like these data driven type of cultures or or companies where they're doing all these little tiny small things. Okay, well, we're going to move the button over here or we're going to change, you know, we're going to go from 17 to 15 tutorial steps. But it's like, whoa, whoa, if you're not moving the metrics, you got to, you know, you got to go big, yeah. right? And, and so yeah. I think that, that's basically, bigger. Go that's ahead. actually the, the other approach that we eventually kind of came to to realizing that we, we should, should should have done that, that the problem is in the, in the, in the core gameplay, right? Mm. And and but all, I I realized it only in late 2022 when everything was kind of already in a negative tone, uh, in a sense. Um, but yeah, if, if if something doesn't work, change something boldly. Like it doesn't right. have to be like a pivot of you know I'm making an, a strategy game and, and pivoting into like an idler. No, it, it's still going to be a strategy game, but something doesn't work, and, and this is and this is kind of again the lesson uh, or the finding. But we made a great, great game. Like everybody in the team loved it. They played it, you know, a lot of feedback. And you are kind of stuck in that. Well, well, if this is such a good game, why like the retention is, 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 is not moving in the way uh, we need. And the question is, is, is simple. It's because it's, it's a good game just for this amount of, of people. Yeah. That's it. And it's like a true, and you have to be really honest about it. And, and 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 so if you keep doing this good game for this amount of people, you'll you'll have bad business. And so, so this is one of the you know I think biggest reasons you know we 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 couldn't succeed is we, we we built a really good game, really good game. You know a lot of people are still playing it and actually paying it. It's still up and running, but hmm. we couldn't build we couldn't be we couldn't build uh, a good business out of it because it's just a good game for this amount of people. And, and, and when I realized this, I found certain kind of comfort in, uh, and that it's okay, you know. Um, so, so Anton, in terms of like, so it kind of sounds, you're kind of talking about the game in terms of like, it sounds like with finality, like, oh, it only has this amount of audience. But if you were to think about that time, what, do you think there was anything you could have done uh, wh whether it's going for something bolder or any, in terms of the approach or maybe a different person you could have hired in with a little bit more expertise or like if you were to go back and think about the the thing that you could have changed to make to potentially change the outcome of what happened it, do you think there like what what would you say that is if anything yeah i think i think we should we should have hired somebody kind of with a different perspective yeah. Okay. Because what you tend to fall into when you develop a game that you like and you love for a long time, and in a year even it's a long time already, you you start you start to be you blind to certain things. You like you just don't understand, and you you get into this analysis paralysis and frustration of, but this is good. Like why does why doesn't it work right? And so, I mean. Even like as a leader, like I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, my personal kind of perspective. I also heard this from my team members. It's like we all of us are really experienced. We understand our game and understand other games. It should it should work. Like we get we're getting feedback. Uh, we're implementing positive feedback, and we see positive impact in terms of you know uh, feedback again. But and we are frustrated. And so what you should do at this point in time is just get somebody in the team. Just get fresh blood. I think, and and it, like a very, you know, high caliber, let's say, right? And whatever it means, like the person you can trust. I think this is what it means for me, right? So that you can take this feedback and actually do something different. And so what we should have done is hire somebody and with the help of that person, change the core gameplay in a meaningful way, in like in a really meaningful way, and then make a really clear A-B test. And um, yeah. I think this is one of the most important things, and we should we should have, we should have stopped doing anything else really mm. beyond like maybe building the core, you know, core technical kind of 
stuff that should be done in any ways, but but we've been doing, you know, we've been improving battle paths. We've been like improving, you know, uh, certain kind of gameplay elements like this archer should, you know, should be firing with three arrows at a time now instead of one. And we like, let, let's, let's introduce, you know, perks, uh, like a, abilities, uh, grades, so that they, you know, all those small things that it's obvious it should be in the, in the final game. But before you have cracked the the kind of the DNA of what what works, uh, that's meaningless. It's basically you should burn the money. It's, it will be better. Right. It's it felt it. like you guys were getting into the weeds there, and I right. mean, like I think you know one thing is like if the team and, and like we have you know I think I'd say we have like sixty seventy unique companies now. So I'm not gonna sit here and pretend that every team. Every team's game is a hit game right out the gate. It's, I mean, it, I think your experience is more more common um, than talked about. Um, and, you know, sometimes the team's able to be that person for themselves. Um, and oftentimes also, like, us as investors or us as board members are kind of that person for them. Where we're like, okay, let's commit. Let's do, do these changes that you wanted to try. Um, let's see where that gets you. Uh, and if it doesn't get you to where you want to be, then let's have a serious conversation, honest conversation about what do we do now, right? And sometimes that's a, let's go back to the drawing board. Um, let's change the core mechanic because obviously it's not working. Um, and we'll say, great, because that's a decision that's moving on, that's thinking about the company long term. And how you end the game is also how you start a new game. And sometimes that's having a, ending that on a positive note as opposed to something dragging on people kind of becoming more frustrated like why is this not working it's good sometimes you just need to start fresh um yeah yeah i think this is kind of the notion of what is the biggest fire right and i do think that in my experience it's it's like and based upon my experience like when i worked on this game king of avalon which wound up being pretty very successful but like there were a hundred fires but i think the thing that we did right is we understood we can have 98 things go wrong but let's the one or two things that have to be right. Let's get those right. Um, and so, and I also think it's kind of psychological too. It's it, because when you have a hundred fires, you're like, oh, well, I know I can work on this and I know it can get better. And here's this other little thing over here. I know if we do that, that can get better. And there's almost like this fear of, but there's this huge fire that's burning down the house. That one's <laughs> scary. So I'm just going to work on these other things and not address the thing that's burning the house down. Right. And so, I do feel like that's something where, I, and I, I'm not saying that was your situation, Anton, but that's a situation that I've seen often before in other game teams. It's like, yeah, let's let's get to the biggest fire. And this, so, so one part is identifying what that fire actually is and then putting all your resources on that. So somebody yeah. I knew once called it cart tricks in the dark, where you get so okay. fixated on doing the cart tricks in the dark that nobody's really <laughs> seeing. <laughs> but you're just really obsessed with it and that's right. all you do but it's not it's not the main fire as you say right and so anton maybe going back okay so going back to the story um what what yeah. happened from there so basically it was like end of 2021 we were like on a relatively well pass of you know experimenting uh you know trying to improve this and that and uh, uh, we went on the kind of second round of fundraising we were going to go, but um, our partner, my, my Games Venture Capital, basically uh, helped us qu- really quickly to find a source of funding for the kind of follow-up round for kind of the next year, right? Um, and so we were like super happy. Every, ever since then, we now have the money for the next year. And we, we had like a team meetup. We tried to talk about those problems. We decided we, we actually go back to the core gameplay um, and try to understand, you know, what's really working, what not, how to actually improve it. And actually, at the time, we decided to work on the on the um, on the tutorial on the onboarding. And so that was a mistake, but the core gameplay was the right thing to do. Uh, and so we started doing this, uh, trying to close the uh, the second round, and then the war started. Mm-hmm. And it started for us uh, like for by, by war. You mean Ukraine, Russia is is what you're referring to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Russia basically invaded Ukraine, and it was it was terrible. It was 
uh, because I'm, like the team is distributed, right? Was mm-hmm. distributed. You know, I, I came from Belarus. My partner came uh, came from Russia. Uh, we have team in Russia and Belarus. Um, uh, we have Ukrainians in the team, and um, and so when we you know waking up in the morning and you know our friends are there in Kiev uh, in Kharkiv. Uh, and relatives actually also yeah uh, it was devastating but um but just let set it aside business wise uh on on the on the eve of the of this day 23rd of february uh i got the contract to sign the final contract to sign to get the money to get the financing and i i didn't sign because i was just busy and i thought i'll sign tomorrow I was I was busy with something, and and we are waking up next day and it, it's war, right? And so, and we actually I was so happy I didn't sign because the money eventually proved to be really toxic coming from Russia, and so if we signed that would would have been kind of even more difficult to kind of solve this kind of corporate situation. So we didn't sign. Uh, and started to basically fight for the future of the company uh, and the team. Uh, and many months, it was just trying to work with psychological kind of, you know, stabilizing people, helping them, and, you know, trying to wire the money because everything stopped working in Belarus and, and, and Russia and uh, people are kind of running out of mind. How do you, how do you actually kind of give it to them? Nothing works. Uh, so we are working with crypto and, and stuff. And uh, and trying to develop the product, right? And trying to understand. So, what shall we do next? Because we have like x x months in the of the money in the bank, and it's 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 quickly quickly running out, uh, running out. Yeah. And so so we quickly pitched to certain investors, and we understand that you know with uh, within the current climate, we couldn't trace because my games was associated with uh, with VK, which is like sanctioned company. And uh, like, like the company, my game, the company is like totally perfect. Like it's, it's just a business. It's great people, right? But because they associated with, you know, this capital, you know, nobody really does business with you, and it makes sense. I totally understand. I actually embrace it. Uh, and so we talk through this with my game fetch capital. We find find out the way to kind of rearrange the, the investment uh, to basically try to raise um uh try to make the company investable basically the raise uh on the uh, on the market it was a hard negotiation it was a lot of paperwork it took like six months really um uh, but we found a way to kind of structure it you know, uh, in a meaningful way and to your point uh felicia when you're saying like uh, the company owns the investor owns 51 percent in an option it doesn't make sense for anybody else to come totally. And, and so we rearranged that to make kind of the company investable. Uh, but, and we hoped also that, you know, the war will, will start to kind of solve out somehow. Like everybody hoped that it will end and, and, and everything kind of stabilizes closer to the end of the year. But basically when I f- found myself in, in, in September with a company that is structured in a way that could be, could get money from investors, the war is going on, right? And everything is getting worse and worse and worse. And the macro situation is going worse, right? And I'm talking to investors and everybody's just freaking out because, you know, uh, AT&T, how do you buy traffic? You know, money is becoming expensive because of expl- inflation. You know, we, we still have people in Russia and Belarus because we don't have money to relocate them, really. Uh, and we spent the last money trying to kind of help our team go out of, of Russia because of mobilization, right? Um, such such a, a black swan, right? Such a big problem you have to solve because of this. And you still have to think about the product and then try to develop it out. So that was like on one side it was like a heroic deed in, in a way we kept the team we we, we tried to kind of you know uh, help everybody 
We try to develop the game. We try to race. We try to restructure. But eventually, you know, all of that failed because we, when we've done all of that and, and try tried to fundraise, we found that, you know, we were, you know, like we couldn't do it basically for many reasons. And we were so busy, you know, we were so busy trying to solve all those problems that we, you know, missed that, you know, we don't have the game that is, you know, uh, rock solid, right? And that we probably should do something, you know, different, that, that we probably should launch it globally you know, earlier, that we should probably maybe, you know, get it, you know, do something else with the game and not try to solve those problems because solving those problems doesn't lead you, don't lead you to, to basically the future. We were a little bit optimistic uh, in assessing the, the, the macro situation, the, the micro situation, our product and our, our team and our ability to fundraise. Over optimistic. Because in, in, in a normal world, we had all the chances. But just the world was different. Every, every possible aspect of what could go wrong went wrong, outside and inside. And we, we had not the, kind of the, the best product. I think I, I still think we have a really good product in a way that we could pivot it and work around it if we like had enough capital and an office and do, like we wouldn't have to save people from from you know going to war just and just work you know and just go into conferences and you know having a good partner who is focused on you and just just work with that capital and 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 maybe yeah still the game would be you know a failure but um, in, in the in the reality, we didn't have any chances of doing this. Uh, this is kind of my conclusion, and we just you know kept going and exhausted ourselves to an extreme extreme way, like in, in financially, psychologically, um, to a point that we couldn't you know play our game because like oh my god. Um, and um, I'm so I'm so grateful to the team that you know stayed with us with us until the very end. Like um, most of the 15 people stayed until the very last day, and it's just extraordinary. Um, and um, yeah, I think it was a, a super talented star team that just got into the the worst possible you know situation, like many other teams. Uh, and and me as a founder and kind of CEO, I feel sorry that I couldn't help them, you know, to you know to the full potential in terms of you know them working in a good environment and them, you know, building that game to 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 the success. I couldn't kind of help them go through this. Um, Right. And and so and so so we we fundraised for for a while like September October November we tried every VC we tried every like more creative kind of way of raising capital let's say uh, and, and nothing worked like everything dried up uh, and uh, first of December I start I decided to kind of let the team go with my partner and um, we just pushed the game with a couple of developers couple of key people we pushed the game to Apple like. 14 of December, globally on Apple, and we just put, push the button on Android on Google. It was already there. We just opened all the countries, basically. Just hey, you know, take it, the world. Uh, we still have a little bit of organics on Google. You know, we still have a little bit of, of, of payments uh, in apps and then ad revenue. Um, and I'm kind of, I'm kind of happy it's there. You know, I think uh, also that from like hundred, you know, studios and hundred games. In development, I think very few actually go live. Um, I don't know, 10, 20 games go live out of 100. Uh, maybe, I don't know. Uh, not not even saying that they're successful and then, you know, earn money. And and our game is different in a way that it, it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's a complex game, right? It, it, it takes time to develop it. It's not a hyper-casual game. It's not even like a hyper-casual game or 
it takes time to build the technology, the foundation, you know, all of those systems from ground up in, a, in an unexperienced before that team, which became experienced through the, those kind of two, two and a half years. It takes a lot. It, it speaks a lot to the team. Uh, and I'm so really, really proud of them. And I'm grateful to them. Anton, I, I've got a few thoughts that come to mind as you, um, you know, kind of uh, get get to the conclusion of your story here. But um, so when you were, so the war breaks out and when you, when you mentioned at that time you had, uh, I don't know, you were running out of cash and then it took six months to negotiate and then you were fundraising. So at that point in time, did you guys have a talk about reduce, reducing burn or did you try to reduce expenses? Did you talk about people taking reduced salaries? Can you talk to us tactically, like in that kind of situation, like what went through your head and how did you try to accommodate having a longer runway, if, if anything? Yeah. So, so we actually, we, we, we raised a little bit from friends and family okay. um, when we, when we kind of realized that, Hey, let, let's try kind of this route. Let's try to figure everything out. And so we need a little bit of runaway, additional runaway. And so we, we, we erased from friends and family. Um, obviously, we, we didn't take any salary uh, as me and my partner from, from February and on. And, and certain uh, key people on the team, the people who started with us, uh, kind of the, the, the studio, like those five, six people, also took um, basically no no salary for a number of months, let's say. Uh, and so it was, it was a really difficult situation. Uh, you know, certain people, we couldn't really uh, fire anybody or, because we felt, you know, it's 15 people and everybody was really playing like an important role. I think it's, it's, it's a relatively lean team for, for the kind of, for the product we, we were trying to build. And, um, but yeah, and so we tried to pay a lot, like 100% to most of the team. And basically the core team wasn't taking any money effectively. So this is was this was our kind of decision. Um, you know, uh, and maybe and it, other... it, 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 it helped us kind mm -hmm. of go through this. Right. And I think one other issue that I think isn't talked about very often is that you kind of alluded to is kind of like the, the psychological impact. I mean... A lot of people don't realize just how difficult it is to be a founder. And in that situation where mm -hmm. you're at right now, you're not taking any salary. You're kind of staring into the abyss of like, oh, are we going to make it or not? Could you talk a little bit about, because I do think even, you know, right now, and we've got, we, we actually have a lot of cash in the bank, but even I am like, you know, like some of the, the emotions, the, the kind of, um, you know, kind of impact to your psychology of all the problems that you're facing and things like that. Could you speak a little bit about how, what you were dealing with and like how maybe your, your relationship with your, with your partner and some of the other people in the company, like how did you kind of deal with that or what, what were you kind of feeling at that time? You know, it was a lot of panic initially, like what's going on? What's what? What's good? Like you had it, like you had a funding for a year, and this day and next day you don't, right? And you are, you know, realizing everything's falling apart. And I was really successful uh, with who my partner is. Um, he's a he's a super helpful and you know balanced person, and so he helped me go through it um, and kind of listening to my concerns and, and, and fears and you know um, and we were discussing a lot of that and he took a lot of heavy lifting in terms of you know going through you know operational you know clusterfuck uh, trying mm -hmm. to sort everything out talking to people so he took a lot of uh, that on him and so i'm really grateful to him i think i'm very lucky uh, uh, with that um but you know i i i, I found that I was kind of trying to work more, basically, not to, you know, go insane, right? And to, to cope with my, you know, emotions and fears and, and doubts, et cetera. Just, just work more. That was kind of the mantra. I actually don't think this, is, this was the right thing to do. I think I should have done more outside of work uh, in terms of, you know, 
building relationships with you know keeping relation or maintaining relationship with my family uh doing a lot of you know sports and physical etc i think that that should be uh, the working more like you should you should abstract yourself from what's going on and if you work more you're just getting in that rabbit hole and you don't see more you don't you see less actually and you understand less so you should you know, stop uh for a second you should you should work less and then for, when it was started and when the problem started you know every day I was working more and more and more and more and so you're kind of seeing less less and understanding less 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 and less so this is an important important lesson for me Got it. And, um, oh, sorry. And Felicia, post the war, did um, did Anton reach out to you guys? And what would it have taken in that kind of situation, in those kinds of situations that you see? What would it take to invest in a company that you know, la- well, kind of like launched a game at least in sort of soft launch, has has some metrics, going through some issues with geopolitical concerns like that? What would it, what would it have taken for for you to kind of look at that deal? Or to, or to invest in in that kind of a situation? Yeah, I think uh, Anton had reached out to us and I think he did speak to a couple of colleagues of mine on the team. And I remember we looked at that deal. Um, and, and I mean, first first of all, I think, thank you, Anton, for sharing that story. I mean, it's, it's obviously very personal and raw. Um, and and, and my, my sympathy is obviously to, to yourself and your partner and everybody on the team for having to go through that truly black swan um unforeseen event um i think for us the biggest challenge that we had was just on i know you restructured um some of that agreement in terms of the equity holding that my games had that i think was was for us the biggest challenge of of being able to consider an investment into that and i think it's it is also the case for any startup that's raising now if you have things on your cap table that need to be restructured. Like that is a big kind of negative point, unfortunately, an investor's consideration, just because that just means, you know, this is not a straightforward deal in the sense that let me invest into you. We'll get the investment done. You guys go back. There's a lot of work that needs to be done with the cap table, renegotiating. Um, It took you six months to negotiate that. So I didn't have that context, but, you know, if, for example, we come back to you and said, like, we can't, we still can't, right? You need to renegotiate that. I don't know mm-hmm. whether they would have taken that either. I am guessing not if that's what, you know, you had the relationship mm-hmm. with them, if that's what you managed to get it into. But I, I think that the deal was, was okay uh, um, it I think it was favorable for, for all the parties, let's say, and kind of optimizing for the, for the success of the game, really. Mm-hmm. Not kind of going into too much of the detail there. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, but I think uh, the feedback I got from from your team at the time was was more around the product, and I think that's fair. I think, um, yeah, I think if I were if I were you, I would ask kind of same questions, and I would you know have the same doubts, right? Uh, from the inside, it's 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 always seems like. Well, why don't they invest into me? You know, I'm such a good guy. I'm such a good, you know, tech. I'm such a good team. I'm such a good game. Right. Uh, but on the outside, there were like, you know, hundreds. There were literally hundreds, right? You know, uh, of students like this, or, or thousands. I don't know. And, and so you, you, you're like, you have a luxury of, of choice, and it's like, this is how it works, right? Uh, and right. this is one, yeah. and then, and then B, it's just the macro situation was was not suitable for investments. And we could not, as a studio, you know, live without investments anymore. And so there is no match there, right? It's, yeah. it's just it's just business uh, as it is, uh, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, the product was one thing. The metrics wasn't where you wanted it to be. I think the other part was just the, the structure of the repayment. Um, and... And then I think, you know, the timing of when you raised this wall was when things were starting to kick off. So for a lot of VCs, even and, and more so now, um, oftentimes, you know, it's not just like, hey, should I invest into new company A, right? Um, a lot of VCs are looking at bridging their existing companies. So when they're looking at opportunities, they're looking through the lens also of like, let's say you're raising three million. Well, that's three million that I could be investing and bridging some of my other companies whom I've already invested into 
whom I've been working with, whom I know, you know, better their capability of execution, for example, uh, or maybe they have more metrics. I, I, I just know their situation a lot better and I've invested into them. And if I think about where my 3 million could go with them uh, versus doing a new company investment, so that's something I need to think about as well. Um, and yeah, a lot of early stage funds are going to be at that, that point now thinking about bridging. And so it's an opportunity cost evaluation as well. Right. And yeah, Anton, I want to thank you for telling your story, but maybe like just in terms of thinking about where we are now in the future and Anton, it seems like you're going to be shifting more towards like an investment sort of role. Felicia, could you talk about a little bit more on this topic? And and I did have an opportunity to talk to a couple couple of uh, venture capitalists on a previous podcast, and kind of like the the thought in terms of where we are in the industry today is that some LPs and venture funds are kind of guiding down, saying, "Hey, let's let's kind of slow down a little bit here." But where, how are you thinking about new investments? And and maybe Anton, you can also speak about when you start your new role. You know, in terms of the lessons sure. you learned from your operational experience, what are you going to be looking for? when you think about investing in new companies in the current environment, and maybe Felicia, you could actually characterize your take on the current environment as well for, for new investments and new studios. We are going to continue investing into new companies. We are going to continue Great. focusing on that, that early stage pre-seed, seed, series A stages. We'll still continue investing into free to play. I think, like I said, um, you know, the things that we look for in the team composition has shifted. Um, we acknowledge that mobile free to play is a lot more competitive than it was like 10 years ago, right? That's just the truth. So, you know, we're, we're looking also for teams who kind of have thinking on innovation in terms of genre of gameplay or even just blue ocean opportunities. And, and some of those things could be, you, you know, like, um, things that are outside of gaming per se, that, that could be the gaming and intersection of lifestyle. So things like gaming and dating, how would you do that? Or, or gaming and, and romance or uh, gaming and mental wellness. Like, are there these kind of blue ocean areas that can be played in that's just a little li- bit less competitive and also ripe for disruption? Um, I think we're also looking a lot at cross-platform play just as a way, uh, you know, for games to, to have better engagement and retention over time. Um, some of the things that we love seeing are, are teams that have kind of thought about, you know, if... There's only so much you can do in terms of optimizing CPIs. Can we rethink things of how we've traditionally done distribution? And part of that is cross-platform. Some people are looking at alternative app stores. Some people are looking at how do you uh, monetize through other payment rails, whether that's Exola or something else, um, or app charge or something else like that. So I think teams who are thinking innovatively and also thinking about their go-to-market proactively, like I said, you can't just say influencers. Uh, you have to think a little bit more. Um, you can't just say we're going to have great organic traffic and that's going to be like, oh, because we have uh, featuring from Apple and Google. We know that that stuff doesn't work anymore. Um, it can't just be ASO because that doesn't, number one, that doesn't work for every genre. Um, and number two, uh, that has a pretty capped upside in terms of traffic that you can get and installs. So looking for teams that have thought a little bit more about that strategy. It's not to say that they have a proven method, but Honestly, I don't think a lot of people have thought about it. So just the fact that you've kind of thought out these are experiments that we want to do, we want to prove it out, that already puts you ahead of competition in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, I think, you know, a lot of the things that I talked about, you know, early stage VCs thinking more about bridging companies, for example, that's that's probably still going to be true for for a lot of the funds out there. And that's also because, you know, we play at the early stage, right? Um, let's say later stage investors, they are fewer generally, they have bigger funds, um, they're writing checks, but they have their pick and they're being very, very picky. So, you know, before, whereas like you maybe you just need maybe D7 retention, if that, right? Now they're asking D14, D30. Um, now they'd like to see revenue, actually, if, there, if there's a hierarchy of metrics, right? EBITDA. Uh, ROAS comes first and then, uh, well, retention comes in the second tier um, metric that mm-hmm. they want to look at. Um, so they want, their demands are higher. And the really, reality is that a lot of the early stage, like you said, it takes time to build this stuff out. It takes time to get those metrics. So, you know, when that happens, um, you know, early stage startups are also turning to their investors and saying, okay, well, maybe we need to bridge you so you can get there because it's also not a great fundraising 
uh, environment. So maybe you get to a better stage. And then in 2024, you raise a better round, um, better price round. Um, so that's also where some of that bridging pressure is coming from. It's not because like, you know, we don't want to invest in new companies. Um, we'll still do that. Um, it's just it's just the dynamics between the early stage and later stage um, investors as well. Okay. And Anton, as you shift into your new role with all of the, the experiences now that you've had, both working at Wargaming and your own entrepreneurial experience, if you're thinking about investing in a new company or to bet on a new company, given your experience, what would you be specifically looking for? Well, uh, first, uh, yeah, let me say that I, I joined like a couple uh, couple weeks ago as an investment director, a new, a new gaming company. We are mm-hmm. still in stealth mode, okay. hopefully to come, come out on light in, in a month or so. Uh, but the, the business is basically uh, like in private private VC fund, really, uh, with, with a really heavy touch of, hey, let's invest in good teams, let's help them grow, and then uh, consolidate and, you know, go IPO. Uh, and all those kind of mobile companies, mobile mobile, mobile market. Uh, so, but the, the thesis we are kind of trying to, to, to uh, figure out now, the investment thesis is, hey, you know, the, the VC funding is drying up for kind of serious A kind of follow on investments uh, or dried out, dried out already. And, and this will kind of keep happening for 2023 at least. Uh, and, 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 you know, mobile marketing will still be difficult for at least 2023 and, and maybe even more when Google also introduces their limitations in tracking. Right, so everything is, is kind of, and, and probably macro will will get worse. There's a high risk because macro is getting worse in 2023. Uh, so there's a lot of risks that are staying kind of deep risks, right? But does it mean that they're be- that the teams are getting better? Oh, sorry, worse. No, the teams are teams are still there. They're good, but they're not trying. They're not able to get money, and they are facing challenges, right? And so, why don't we kind of opportunistically understand? You know, is there a gap where like a good team couldn't get enough money to deliver on the on the vision? Also, because what you Joe mentioned before, you know, to uh, to develop and then soft launch and be in soft launch for a while and then grow for a mid core game or a game like or a meaningful kind of game, the game which has the potential to become a you know like a, a like a hobby, like a lifetime game, right? Right. You know, it takes time and money, and so a lot of investors don't have appetite or patience or risk appetite to, to do it, right? So here we come and say, okay, you know, you have a problem. You know, for example, you're stuck in a soft launch and, and you're running out of money, and, and it's basically you're, you're on the verge of shutting down, right? For example, uh, and there will no VC follow on because you know you haven't proved yourself, right? So. But we come in and say, okay, like we understand that you need another six months in that soft one. And it's okay, right? But we help you to think from outside what is the problem, right? Because you probably are, you are stuck because you, you know, don't see things. Not because you are stupid, because you, you're like, for certain, re- for certain reasons, you don't understand what to do next, right? We'll help you to understand what to do next, to change this, to, you know, either to you reach positive ROAS, in you know, faster or improve your retention or scale from you know from 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 like fifty thousand a month scale to five hundred thousand a month right to be able to pay the studio bills and, and grow 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 right so we are coming in as that kind of force um because we think there is opportunity there and that opportunity will build up as we go into 2023 and 2024 got it and, and anton just to like Go back to the question. So if you, given your experience and so forth, were to evaluate a team seeking additional funding to extend their soft launch or whatever, what are the top two or three characteristics or things you'd be looking okay. for from that team to make you say, okay, I'm going to bet on this team. We're going to invest in, in this company versus another company. I think, frankly speaking, in my experience and what I'm hearing from, from friends and industry is, and, and, and see myself, the greatest metric for success is, you know, uh, is, is you are being a serial founder. So if, if this is your second studio, you have a much greater chance of success versus um, 
versus somebody fresh. Um, and so I would I would first uh, look at this because when you are a second time you know founder, you automatically don't do so many mistakes. You don't go into genres which are super heavy to you know to go into because they're red ocean or you know and. Or you don't go for a hundred percent blue ocean, which where like everything in your concept and idea is is hundred percent new. Let me switch slide. Right. So you 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 are realistic. You understand like what is a plus one innovation. It's, you understand so many other things. You understand how to build a team better, how to avoid certain mistakes, how to build relationships with VCs, how to not not to over test, so that you are still kind of, you know, attractive to, to VCs, let's say, et cetera. Um, and, and second, I would invest in teams who, uh, I think I will echo Felicia, who think a lot of, about marketing and, and who are uh, proactively kind of speaking about it uh, in a way that are confident about, about it. Because nowadays there is a lot of um, panic around, hey, nothing works. But when I speak to, to founders here in Cyprus at a lot of gaming companies, so when I speak to them and, and asking them, hey, how, how do you do marketing now, right now? Those who used to uh, have revenue before at and they say, well, it changed, but like we adjusted, it's okay. It, it became difficult, more difficult, but it's okay. Those who didn't do marketing before ATT changed, they don't, they don't know how to do it now, right? right? So this is the separation, right? If you knew how to do it before, you will adapt much, much more easier to, new, to a new environment. So I would, I would look at those teams who are confident uh, around uh, marketing in the new realities because they've done marketing, marketing before. Right, so they are they are not optimistic. They're not pessimistic. They are realistic. They are okay. You know, there are ways around. We'll do this, this, and we'll, we test. So, I think this is, yeah, this too is is very important these days. Yeah, I think to add on to Anton's point as well. Like, I think the, another quality that that that's in common with kind of those people that you're talking about, or I think developers who are challenging their own assumptions. Um, I think the the space, everything has changed so much that like if, you know, maybe you felt like um, you, you had certain assumptions about how marketing is done, for example, like you have to challenge those. Or if you had certain assumptions of, for example, like what is a sexy genre? Uh, you know, sometimes those unsexy genres, like the puzzle, like word games, honestly, chess, is sexy to some, it's not sexy to some, um, or, you know, certain type of social casino games. Those games are the ones that actually do make money. Um, maybe they not they don't fit exactly what some preconceived notion of what games are, but you know I think it's good to good to look at the data, good to dig into it, um, spot trends and opportunities, and do that homework. I know we've been running a little bit long here, but maybe I can ask one last question to both of you. And so, Anton, I know you had run into geopolitical risks and things like that, and I think as we are moving into a more global environment. You know, we've got distributed teams in some cases. We've got more global kind of interconnections here and there. But it, it seems to me, and in my own experience, there does seem to be a lot of increased like macro and geopolitical global macro risk. And so as a leadership team, you know, for example, e even in my own experience, we had 8 million in SVB when, when they went down and there was real <laughs> risk of, of us going out of business for that. I think that we have to also navigate, you know, we may have a default soon in, in the U.S. based upon all the, the politics happening. And I have to manage U.S. dollar versus Indian rupee INR currency risk. Um, we also like if we were targeting the Indian market, there's like there's like bands of a lot of a lot of apps in India that that have relationships to, to China and, and vice versa. In China, there's, there's a lot of bands on, on various various apps and things like that. And so. When you think about the new environment in which we're operating and global macro awareness or the requirement of that of leadership teams, how do you guys think about what is how how up to speed or how knowledgeable do new 
leadership teams need to be of macro, global macro, geopolitical risks versus, say, two years ago? How important is that? Are you guys going to be looking for that kind of awareness in leadership teams as, as you guys make investment decisions? I would say it's not something that we would, you know, prioritize as like a must have because mm -hmm. realistically there's, there's a, I mean, geopolitics is a very difficult <laughs> yeah. nuance to understand space, to be honest with you. Um, and, you know, if, if, if I think having some awareness is good, but I, th I don't think it's also something that you can obsess too much over because realistically these things aren't really within your control obviously if you're choosing to play within certain markets like india right or um, you know what those risks are if you're choosing to do uh, web3 in the us you know that <laughs> that's not probably a great spot um so i think you know you have to be aware of those things as it as it you know, and prioritize what makes sense for your specific business but i wouldn't say that's like a quality that um you know it's, it's something that we specifically look for um, I think, you know, this is also kind of where working with your board and investors is great because probably they're going to be looking at those spaces and have more intel um, and hear more, you know, through the grapevine of what might happen, what's going to happen than you are. And so you want to make sure to have, use your board, use your investors to figure out and stay up to date of, of what's going on. Um, you know, if when something like SVB happened, obviously it's just, that was a tense weekend, but you know, I, I know for most of the the great investors that we co-invested with or we work with, like most investors were, you know, on the phones with their companies and checking who's impacted, how much is the potential impact, um, you know, trying to figure out solutions, um, you know, trying to figure out, you know, like what if you can't access that bank account come Monday morning, um, or you know, you can't access those funds, so. Like, I think working with your investors is great. I think being part and connected to other founders as well is great because oftentimes the best advice you're going to get on like how another founder has dealt with it, how, how to deal with the situations, how another founder has dealt with it. Um, and, and, you know, we're, 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 that's something that we try to foster within play that founders kind of are openly sharing. So, you know, um, it's not just SVB, right? Whenever anything happens, uh, that's something that they help each other with. Right. So what you're saying is be aware of relevant risk, but you don't necessarily need to become an expert because that's going to eat up a lot of time. Right. But well, part, partner yeah. to characterize the risk, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And Anton, what about you? What yeah. do you think? Yeah, that's actually my point too, is that uh, the modern reality of, of macro is creating uh, the, basically the overhead on, on the founding team or the management team. Like, it's not even a question of uh, whether you have to, you know, uh, be knowledgeable about it or not. Yes, you have to, right? Otherwise, you're out of business, right? So, and so it's either you do it or you hire somebody, right? It's just overhead in terms of time or money. Um, it's inevitable. Um, I, I see it in businesses all around the world, uh, in, in startups, right? You're kind of thinking more about where the money is coming from. Uh, you're thinking like uh, you're asking teams uh, like do you have people here and there right or uh, yeah or like where like do you have a bank account even if you have a Russian passport like how do you open a bank account do you know if it's not getting, getting you know frozen or something like have you have you passed your KYC recently um, it's those questions before were much more easier to kind of not even solve like to ask and, and quickly answer. And now there is a whole discussion around it. So you spend time, you spend money, you spend resource, mental power. Um, so in terms of me as an investor looking at the teams, I will just be aware that this is a factor now. And um, it's definitely a factor. And yes, I will just kind of assess quickly whether the founder is aware. But I think it's hard not to be aware these days. All right. Well, Anton, Felicia, thanks so much for your time and insights. I think that was my last question. So, so maybe uh, just to end things off, if you have one last bit of advice for our audience and then how could they contact you if they wanted to, to reach you guys and maybe starting with you, Felicia. Yeah. Um, if you want to contact and reach me, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I'm on Twitter at uh, PPPHYL, very inventive. 
Um, I think last piece of advice, if you're looking to raise this year, <laughs> try to raise next year. But if you have the time, like, like I said, you know, try to try to study trends and opportunities. I think the best time to be pitching is actually when you don't need to be fundraising. Use that opportunity to like soft pitch, catch up with investors, um, you know, that you know in your network on a quarterly basis if you can. Um, just because the market is moving really quickly and you want to also kind of get those early signals of when things are starting to pick up. And and yeah, by that time, you, you probably would have had the opportunity to kind of refine some of the hypotheses you have and some of the pitches that you have as well. Okay, great. Anton? So yeah, everybody who's listening, just please keep doing the games. You know, keep doing new games. Uh, I think it's worth it. Um, there is no one way to success. Um, every successful game came to be this came to be such like in its own way, mm-hmm. uh, and it's only because people kept doing those games. So just keep doing it. And uh, if you want to talk, um, reach out on Facebook or LinkedIn. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, Anton, Felicia, thanks so much. And for our audience, we'll catch you next time. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Joe.